our King, our Redeemer, the risen Lord might indeed be exalted above all. I pray that as we look at the implications of the resurrection of Christ, that we do not only know Christ more, but our lives might be altered for His glory, for His purpose. And so minister to your people, O Holy Spirit. Administer clear instruction. Father, may you be honored in all these things. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This Resurrection Day, I'd like to look at a very unique index. You know, you have books that you studied in, in high school or in college. Uh, where do you normally find the index? At the back. At the back of the book. And the use of the index is to make sure that if there's something that you need to uh, look for, that you'll find it with a page number. Because of the many subject matters in a certain book, the subjects are more or less uh, too numerous uh, to, uh, to be presented at the table of context. And so you have an index. And so indexes are very important, especially for careful study. Now, indexes, uh, are not only helpful with books, but uh, in general with many things in life. Like, for example, uh, I live uh, in La Prada, uh, in Garden, which is somehow in the boundary lines of Mesquite and Garden. And uh, I've been there since the year 2000, but we bought a house that was built in 1972. And to this day, we still enjoy that simple little house that we have. Especially now that uh, my wife and I are totally empty nested. The wood is more durable. And there is less movement in uh, the neighborhood. More or less, uh, the owners have settled, and so we, we kind of like know each other. We look out for each other. And so when someone is in need, somehow the neighbors are not embarrassed to knock and, and, and tell you that something has happened to the neighbor next door. We love that kind of feel. There's, however, a sense of mystery when we first got into that house in the year 2000. I loved it. My kids loved it because it was colored pink inside. There, you know, I had two daughters. Of course, I had to change the color. But there was a mystery in that house. I was told that that house was the first house built on, on that vicinity, in that village. And I was told that back in the days, in 1970s, the Prado was quite a village. It was an illustrious village, I was told, because it was very near Northwest Highway. And so I was told that La Prado was actually a good village to live in back in the early 70s. And I was further told, I didn't know this uh, when we were buying the house, I just learned after we bought the house that, that, that the house that we, we chose, that we uh, bought, was actually not only the first house, but it was the model house. You know how it is when they're pre-selling homes and there's not a house yet and there's one existing house and they show customers that this is how it's going to be here. And so they come up with a, 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 a show house. And that was my house in 1972. And 
I also gathered from information that the first one to buy it was actually the owner of the person who was developing, was the son of the owner. There was a connection of the one who was developing the village. And he was a very good handyman, very good carpenter, and so he loves to renovate, uh, innovate, extend. And so I was looking at my house, it had a lot of extensions. Like what used to be a two-car garage is, has become an extension of the living room. The patio has become an extension of the kitchen. There's a lot of kitchen. There's a lot of kitchen area. And so what used to be a regular sized house has been super extended, like super sized the fries, sort of. And we like that, except for one mystery. You know why I like the house? You know why I voted? Um, I was outvoted to be sure, but do you know why I voted for it? It's because I, I fell in love with the study room. You know, I'm a man who loves to study, but the study room is mysteriously, for me, it, 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 it has the best location because you won't find it. It's totally hidden. But it's there, and it's able to load up a lot of books, and it has a, a, a very neat setup that makes you feel that you are in some kind of a very scholastic atmosphere, away from the running kids and from the daily chores of home. So I'm able to concentrate, except for one mystery. When we moved in, I turned on the lights and the switches on the study. There was no power. I tried my best. My little knowledge about outlets, electricity, I failed. It was at that time that Manel's dad, who's an engineer, came visiting and he is a very good man who understands all these things, and so I told him about the problem, he said, please, okay, don't worry, son, I'll take care of that. He was about a month, staying in my house, and he wasn't able to figure it himself. And so I said, what in the world is this mystery? All the powers in this house are working except for my study room. Is this a curse? And so what I did, Filipino orientation, remedio. I just got an extension cord, plugged it outside, and I was using the extension as the power source for everything that I had inside that room. Probably overloading it. Well, I got used to it. It was a year that all the power was being sourced from outside through an extension cord. Until one afternoon, there was a distinguished gentleman who really looked decent. He, was, he parked his vehicle outside my house and he kept on pacing back and forth. Pacing back and forth like that. And then he would stand and kind of look like this. And then pace back and forth, go to the side and, and look, at, look at my house. I was watching him and I said, this is not a thief. But what in the world is he doing? Is he interested in my house? So I went outside and I introduced myself and I asked him, excuse me, uh, is there a problem? Are you looking for something or someone? And then he said, oh, oh, oh no, I didn't meant to startle you. I, I'm Mr. Harris. I used to own this house. I was the retail owner of this house, and I'm just kind of like passing through the area, and I thought I'd give it a shot. And I am just a lot of sentimental things going on in my head right now. He said, I'm just amazed that the house is still up and about, and, and, and that you are the proud owners, and, and I'm so sorry I, I disturbed your peace. And, and I said, no, not at all. And so we carried on a good conversation. He told me how proud he was in extending this and extending that. And while he was telling his story, suddenly the light bulb went. 
I said, my goodness, now I can sort help. Now the mystery is going to be solved. So I asked him, Mr. Harris, let me cut you short. Sir, but uh, let me ask you a quick question. You see, I have a study room, the study room that you built right inside the master's bedroom. Oh, Dad, that's the only room that has, has no power source, I said. And then his eyes, oops. Oh my goodness, how long has this been? I said, almost a year and then there's no power. And then he said, I had forgotten to write in the index. Yes. My goodness. That there's actually power in that room. But the switch is somewhere else. <laughs> the switch is somewhere else. Yes, you see, I ran out of options. And so, because I own the house, and I know my house, I thought, who cares? And so I placed the switch at the sunroom. The sunroom. Yes, I'm so sorry. But I should have told you. But go ahead and try it. And so I rushed. I turned that thing on, and my heart was palpitating as I raced to my study. And when I went to my study, my goodness, oh my goodness, the lights were all on and I was a happy man. Because finally, the index was given to me because for one solid year, my context was out of place. I really thought that there was no hope, that there was no power. But all along, there was power running through the system and I was just not aware where the switch was. Resurrection Sunday is about an index, people. Many followers of Jesus are experiencing what I detect as a serious power loss. If not a total absence of power, they walk around, they believe Jesus, they say they love Jesus, but they're not experiencing the kind of power that's supposed to be felt and experienced and seen in the lives of those who follow Jesus. Like Jesus is talking about abundant life. What in the world does that even look like if you're not experiencing the power that was promised? The dunamis. It's kind of like a, a power that is so present and so visible that you will say, my goodness. You live life differently. At least, that has to be noticed if you are a follower of Jesus. The problem is if you claim that you're a follower of Jesus and no one notices. And you're just walking around and you just live like there's no Jesus. Because there's no power. Is there a possibility that the index has not been tapped. That's so why providentially, when I was looking at the book of Romans, I looked at verses 3 and 4, and it spoke about an unusual index in the life of the believers. And this has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it, 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 just, it is so neat that it falls on a Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, if we're going to be on this, so I'm not going to miss any segments of this series. And so without much ado, I'd like to call your attention to uh, an important matter here. The first one is that of the center. Do you know that uh, a, a, a prominent Oxford historian uh, once said, in a world that's bombarded by irrelevant information, clarity is power. And that is so true about us, because in this day and age, we are bombarded with several pieces of bits of information on how we ought to live and what life is in general. And so we are a bunch of, where do I go from here? I'm so confused with all this stuff, with all this information. And then the Oxford professor goes on to say that humans really think in terms of stories rather than in facts. 
we tend to think more in terms of stories rather than in terms of numbers or in terms of <coughs> equations. And the simpler the story, the better. And the problem with stories sometimes, that stories are, do, they do have a flow. But more often than not, the precision and the accuracy is absent. That is the reason why at times we lose the center of what we believe. When we hear stories or testimonies that this works and this does not work, we never ask the source, what are the facts? What are the percentages? We just buy the story, hook, line, and sinker, based on how the storyteller wraps it. So the storyteller is brilliant. We just buy it. Hit. I'll buy that. And then we receive the gadget. And then we use it and it breaks. Because we got sold out. And that's the reason why Christianity, if we're going to proclaim and, and to believe it, and of course we say that we believe it, do we really know the center of what it is? Is it a mere story, a fabrication, a myth? Or is it solid history? Actual, precise, true to life, verifiable history. And that's the reason why the Apostle Paul is taking time to present the case that if you're going to believe Christianity, you have to know for certain, accurately, precisely what you believe. At the very center of this account, In verse 3, we are told, the gospel that I wish to convey to you concerns his son. Concerning the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. That's verse 3. We will only deal with two verses today. But the first important thing that we find here is at the center of the gospel, the very thing that we believe about the Christian, about Christianity, at the very center is a son. Not only a regular son of someone, but concerning the son of God. Now, what does that even mean? Do you know that the reason why there was Good Friday and Jesus had was crucified was primarily because of his claim that he was God's son. Well, in John 10.30, 10, he declared, in front of the religious leaders, without any trepidation, he just said, I and the Father are one. And all of the religious leaders who studied everything that, that can be learned about faith, the Jewish faith, their jaws dropped in disbelief that this man had the audacity to make that claim that he and the Father are one. And, and don't misread this because this is what they said. He makes himself equal with God. He claims to be the Son of God. And they ripped their shirts and said, That's blasphemy! And, and ever since they began plotting to kill and crucify Jesus. So make no mistake. The only reason why Jesus was crucified was because of his claim that he was the Son of God. And Paul understood that because you see, all through uh, the book of Romans, for example, in verses in chapter 5 and 10, 
He declares, we were, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Again, Again in, in, in chapter 8, verse 3, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. See, there's make no mistake about that. It's very clear. In, in, in verse 29 of chapter 8, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. There you go again. In, in, in chapter 8, verse 32, God who did not spare His own Son. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son. Jesus Christ our Lord. In verses in chapter 15, verse 28, when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. In 2 Corinthians 1 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us. Galatians 1, 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son again. And then how can we forget this? Galatians 2, 20. Declaration of Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, and so forth and so on. And so we should be clear about this, that the center point of the gospel is the Son of God. Now, do you, do you realize and recognize how unique that thing is? They can choose any religion that you know. Normally, there's a person associated with it. Like Buddhism, it's Buddha. Go down the list. There's always a person who somehow taught it, but that person is never central to that religious group. That teaching can still be taught even if another person brought it up in the open. But Christianity is different. You remove Jesus Christ from the equation of Christianity and there is no Christianity. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the very center of the Gospel. And that is the reason why Paul is trying to tell us the very center of what you have received and what you're being asked to proclaim concerning His Son. The Son of God is centered. And so it behooves me when I, when I think about that, I, I, I tell myself, my goodness, this is amazing that the center of the Gospel is Jesus. And do I really know Jesus? And, and, and by the way, I should be very careful to say that everything that I need to know, at least my finite mind, everything that I should know about Jesus has been revealed. From Genesis to Revelation, it all is this, this a, a, a beautiful disclosure of the Son of God. From Genesis to Revelation. And, and, and shame on me if I claim to be a follower of Jesus, and all that I know about Jesus is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son Jesus. That's all that I know about Jesus. Can you imagine? If, if Jesus is the center, and if Jesus runs the entire story of the universe, and everything has been revealed to me, in scriptures on who he is, and I do not find time and bother 
to get to know who he is. That's a total disconnect from the index, don't you think so? Because if he informs me who I am, and he tells me what I need to do, there's a lot to be digested. It takes a lifetime to know the Savior, just by looking at the pages of scriptures. I am so pleased that when the people, when I drop a, a, a homework and people kind of like, I don't even realize that they take it seriously. Like I'm going through the book of Romans, right? And I just kind of like said, I meant it, but I know it's going to be hard. That I said, uh, do you know that those who love Jesus, like Wesley, they memorized the book of Romans, and that John Chrysostom has someone read the book of Romans three times a week? I'm, I'm asking, have you, have you read the book of Romans in its entirety? Which is synopsis of everything that you need to digest about what just happened to you. And so I, I remember I said, okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to memorize the book of Romans. I'm raising my hand. So I ask for some of you to raise your hands. And some of you are raising hands, some of you are doing this. And then I sort of challenged myself that I was going to memorize it in the regional languages. And it's so painful because I'm actually doing that. But then I realized that there is this person. Lovely, would you please come up here? Yes. And then I realized that Lovely, her name is Lovely, by the way, because she has a lovely memory. And, and, and I didn't realize that Lovely was doing it way beyond my speed. So I'm kind of like, Lovely, you're doing this? Yeah, she has not memorized the entire book, by the way, not yet. Yeah, she did that. But I told her, can you give us a sample of that? Because she said, Pastor, I, I memorized already a bit. Some portions of Romans chapter 1. Then I went ahead, I memorized the entire chapter of Romans 12, she said. But, but, but you know, I, I, I remember because that's my favorite chapter, so I memorized that. But, but no, I have to begin with chapter 1. But I have memorized a few. So I asked, how few? Because I said I'm still in 1 to 7 in the regional languages. She said, uh, uh, 20 verses. I said, can, can you bless us, a lovely? Let's see. The cheat sheet. Okay. Verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, who are called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a son, was a descendant of David. Verse 4, and who through the spirit of righteous, spirit of holiness, was appointed son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 5, through him we have grace, we have been given grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience from the faith, to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles called to belong to him. Verse 7. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 is about all wanting to go with the people. Um, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is reported all over the world. Verse, the next verse, God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray now at last that by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. 
I so long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gifts that you and I, that is, that you and I may be mutually, may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Okay, let me interrupt you. Probably. Uh, that's just verse 11 that you can keep on. I know I am trusting it because I'm reading it. Uh, why are you doing this? Um, so I first started memorizing back when I was in high school as part of, you know, knowing some of the verses so, uh, so that I can share the gospel from memory. And um, I can just I can just share the gospel and be able to be confident to talk about it and not be stopped when something is being asked about the gospel. And then when I joined Awana with my son, so I need to encourage um, Brianna and Aidan to memorize the, the, the word and even the books of the Bible. So I started doing it also myself. And every time I will, um, I will read some, you know, inspirational books and even the Bible. It's just that something will pop up. And I really want to memorize it. It's just, the Word of God is just full of, um, full of wisdom. And God, and, and I'm just fascinated that um, I want to be able to, in any situation, I want to be able to pick something to remember myself. Thank you. Thank you, lovely. Thank you for this inspiring <laughs> When you're done with the entirety of Romans, uh, we'll, we'll have you up again here. <laughs> Incredible memory, spiritual memory of a person who is just manifesting her love to Jesus. I pray that I'll have that tenacity. It's, it's one thing that the lovely point out that I think needs to be underscored, underlined, is when you know the truth, about God and about yourself and it's locked in when you're in battle and when there are problems it is so helpful because you know it's inside you know it's inside I, I, I see Reggie's a good friend a semi-pro basketball player probably noticed that he's so tall that he's in the, in the mix today thank you Reggie for coming out but this guy I watch him and and I watched him. It is fascinating how he loops his three-point shot. He hardly misses. And I'm just guessing, Reggie, that it's all about him. You devote countless hours just looping the arc of the ball, making sure that these hands are positioned this way. And it doesn't matter what you do when you're in a game or in a practice, it looks the same. Why? Because of muscle memory. So I pray that as we get to know Jesus, that we value who He is, not guessing who He is, but that the center of our faith is the Son of God. And remember, the Scriptures is all about Jesus. And so this Easter Sunday, would you give yourself a gift? Convince yourself that it's well worth to memorize portions of scriptures. And don't go for the entire book of Romans if, if you think that's too much. Go for some verses and then try some more. And then you'll find how delicious and delightful it truly is. Because it's the truest thing about you. And of course, before that, the truest thing about God. At the very center is Jesus. And it says, the gospel concerns his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. That's very important that we process that before we move on because it says here that the Son of God was according to the flesh. In the original Greek, it, 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 it goes like this. 
He became flesh. That means he was originally not in that form. Originally, he was infinitely with God, part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in, in this time frame, we are told that he became flesh. Now, this is very important because a lot of uh, skeptics and even those who profess to be Christians say that how can God take on human form? So they say that Jesus was not really fully human. He had a fat, phantom body. He only had the appearance of a body, but not like us. The Apostle Paul is quick to point out that that's not true. Jesus became fully human. Fully God, and yet fully human. That's the term according to the flesh. Not only according to the flesh, but he made sure that there's precision on what kind of, of humanity he adopted. We are told that he was descended from David. So he's not a Gentile, he's a Jew, descended from David. And specifically when you look at scriptures, it, it has been prophesied that he will have to come from the line of Judah, from the 12 tribes, narrow it further, it has to come, the Messiah, the Son of God, who will become the Son of Man, will have to come from the line of Judah, and let's narrow it further. He has to come from the line of David and narrow it further. He has to come through virgin birth, Mary, from the line of David. How narrow can that be? That's why I was still at ease when I was invited in Manila, Philippines, to play the part of Jesus. I played the part of Jesus. And so I stripped my clothing and I was given a little covering here and I was hanging that cross. But I'm Filipino. And I felt a certain silliness about it because I couldn't speak Aramaic. And I had this crown of thorns and I had ketchup. And I was hanging there and I was pretending to be shaking like that. But I was Filipino and I said, this is not right. And so the following year, uh, because I, I, I cycled out, there was another guy who took my place. This time he's Chinese. <coughs> yeah, and he's Chinese, their eyes are so slanted that it looks like... And then his accent was very Chinese. I said, something is really off here. Because, you know, Jesus is not Filipino, Jesus is not Chinese. In God's infinite wisdom, for accuracy and, 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 and just, just clarity, Make no mistake. Jesus has to be a Jew. Because that was what was said. From the line of Judah. From the line of David. The seed of David. That's why son of David. Always constantly <coughs> reigns in the New Testament. In the Old Testament. From the seed of David. Make no mistake about this. The lineage of Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem can be traced, people, in the documents of Israel. There were documents. There was a problem, however, in AD 70. There was a great conflagration and Jerusalem, you know what happened, was decimated. Not one stone laid on top of one because it's totally, totally laid to the ground in AD 70. All the public records were gone. You know why that's problematic? <coughs> because my good friends, my Jewish friends, and I have a lot across the street, across the parking lot, they are my very good friends. I still do visit them every now and then. But they keep on telling me that they are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. 
I look at them and I wonder about this. Because how, how will they verify the line that is prophesied? How? If there is not a single existing record available. How? There cannot be any verification at the moment. In contrast with the verification of the Son of God, who was born Virgin Mary. In contrast to what happened 2,000 years ago, where you can go to the municipal courts and verify if Jesus Christ was born of Mary. can be traced back to David, to Judah, and it's verified. It's accurate. So at the very center of the Christian faith, people, is not some fancy mythology, not some kind of an invention that's not verifiable. It's based on sacred history. It's not a figment of some imagination, but it's holy history, the way God intended it to be. And he doesn't stop there. He moves from the center to the criteria. You know, only you are only fully man, you're weak. Because according to the flesh, that's weak. Jesus came as a baby who needed milk. He cried a lot as a baby. He got tired, he got hungry, and then he got tired, and then he died. That's human weakness. So how can he be saved by a man like that? Not unless there's another aspect to the person of Christ. That's the reason why Paul balances the equation in verse 4 by making it clear and swift again. The gospel concerning his son was descended of David according to the flesh and designated son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. There you go. Now I know that's a mouthful but we're going to write on this text very carefully so that we will get this. What is this criteria that is being set forth upon us? Why is this necessary? Why was Paul taking pains to make sure that we get this? So that we'll be sure about the faith that we hold on to. Well, what's being said is Jesus, the Son of Man, from David, through man, is the designated Son of God. That means designated, that means He was not made, that means He has been the Son of God all along. That means there is no boundary at all. He has been existing as the Son of God ever since. That's the word there that's used. Designated Son of God. He has been Son of God ever since in infinite time. Ever since. And we are told that uh, by virtue of what just happened after the crucifixion, something happened. He rose from the dead according to the Spirit. Now, not according to the flesh. You know, according to the flesh is weak. But according to the spirit of holiness, that's the opposite of weak. Now, in full power, designated Son of God, in full power, according to the spirit of holiness, by His resurrection from the dead. Now, stay on with me because this is very crucial. The Greek word is trying to tell us there, the phrasing is such that, the Lord Jesus demonstrated power by rising from the dead. Why? Because He said, 
that he will rise from the dead. He told his followers that his mission was all inclusive. I was sent by my father to fulfill the mission of redemption and I would have to die on the cross to cover your sins. But then he said, I will not remain in death because I'm God. I will rise from the dead. And he rose from the dead. Now the problem that, that, that I was faced with when I was studying this text is when we look at Easter and resurrection, we always look at it from the vantage point of us. We look at resurrection and, and we go, especially when it's dramatized here, like pretend that there's a Jesus again and we're watching a cantata and although we know the story based on how good the production is like for example if we hire Steven Spielberg and there's going to be some real good effects here uh, and the tomb is empty those who are watching are kind of like palpitating and oh my goodness is, not, is he really going to rise from the dead and when Jesus comes out and, 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 and the tomb is empty what's the overall reaction of the audience it's all and it's dramatized affection like whoa the tomb is empty oh my goodness like Peter Mary when, when, when the stone is rolled away what is their reaction whoa he is not here! I'm just thinking, when, when the Trinity was looking at that, when God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, during the resurrection time, let's go to Jesus. When Jesus rose from the dead, as He promised, by the way, and He stood up, so He's, he's dead, right? And the time was up, that He was supposed to rise again, because death could not contain him. So he rose like, Whoa! I'm alive! Was he surprised? Come to think, was the father like, from heaven, watching his son, did he go, Whoa! It worked! <laughs> or the Holy Spirit, Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh, look at that! Run, Jesus, show them. Show them that you're real alive. Wow, look at that. That, that. that that never happened. You know what? Because they're so set on the truth. They know exactly the program of salvation and redemption. They know that that's exactly what's going to happen. And that is the reason why it is encapsulated in absolute power. Because God is so totally in control of the universe. And that is the reason why if there's any argument about who is powerful and who is not, the argument ends here, people. Because when God said that he's going to die, and then when God said that he's going to rise from the dead, then he did. The argument stops, especially when he tells you, by the way, I did this, I did this, not just for me. I'm just the first one to rise from the dead. And get this. If you put your trust in me, get this. I said this, okay? Not Facebook, not social media, not some Instagram, not Wikipedia. I said this. If you put your trust in me, I guarantee you, you will follow me. Death will be shall swallowed up. Because I said so. If you trust if you surrender your life to me and you invite me into your life to take over as your God, your Lord and say, now think about this have you ever thought of that implication seriously? because if you think about this from the vantage point of humanity it's problematic because there's nothing in the human framework that somehow helps me helps me to process that anything that's dead 
to be brought back to life. There's nothing in my framework, human framework, nothing. I know that when someone's dead, it's dead. There's, that's the point of no return. And that's my problem, whether there's a news that someone has cancer. We go, oh no. We know it's irreversible. And the thing that hits us first is the human index. And what's the human index? <laughs> Once the big C is directed towards you, it's just a matter of time. And they sort of placate you with all kinds of possibilities, but you know, it's just a matter of time. And even if you're not hit with cancer, you're just hit with birthdays. Hmm? My goodness, I was looking at my age. I was looking at my age. I said, how did I turn 58? I arrived in the U.S. when I was 33. That's the age of Jesus. I thought I was going to be forever 33. And now I'm 58 and my kids who used to run around my paint house are all over home. And they're all married. So my vantage point is this. There's no stopping this aging process. So next time you greet me happy birthday, I'm not even smiling. <laughs> because it's actually another term for human cancer. Not unless you subscribe to the power that's outside the realm of humanity. <laughs> there is no hope for humanity. The only hope is the Messiah who took the form of humanity to fully understand and comprehend what's going on with our situation. And then decided voluntarily to, 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 to take upon himself the penalty of our doom the penalty of our spiritual death. If you trust him, he will die for you. How big is that? And don't stay there. Not only did he promise to die for you, he promised to raise you up. Because he was the first to rise. And because he said so. It's the most powerful truth that you should carry in your heart every single day. I'd like for you to think about that for a second. If the truest thing about you is this, that death will have no power over you. <laughs> because God said so. I don't know what's going to happen to your trajectory. Because everything about this human life is to fight against the end of human life. And so we try our best to amass and accumulate and do kinds of all sorts of things and miss the point. But can you imagine if the guarantee is already placed that your eternity is secure. You'll be face to face with God and that the most beautiful mansion on planet Earth will look like some kind of a shanty compared to the mansion that Jesus has prepared for you. By the way, don't quote me on that. Quote Jesus on that because everything that Jesus says, He does. What did He say about mansions? He said, don't get too fixated about your mansions and your homes down there because your homes there they get eaten by mud, by, by, uh, they get rusted, and they get eaten by termites. They're nice, I know. They're good to live in, but remember, I have prepared a home for you. And you know when Jesus prepares something, it's not good, it's not best, it's perfect. 
However, here is the final run. Designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. And here is the final one. Jesus Christ our Lord. Here it is. The, the demarcation line is if you can say that Jesus is your champion. When you say Jesus is your champion, it simply says that you say this wholeheartedly, that Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, your risen Redeemer. But before you say that lightly, I'd like for you to think through about the implications of what you're about to declare. If you're about to declare truly and rigorous today, that the risen Lord is truly your Lord and Savior. I would like you to take time, maybe a minute, to have a conversation with your Lord who is alive. By the way, he's so alive, he's actually interceding for you right now. And he knows exactly what's going on in your life right now. Because he took on complete human form. By the way, he, he did not lose that. He is still fully human and yet fully God, but uh, the distinction is where he is now. He is actually seated at the right hand of the Father. And what he's telling you is this, I know you, you're humans, because I was. I took the form. There is nothing that escapes his affections. You can come to him, but he wants for you to take note of this. That for the longest time, perhaps, you have been pressed down by your baggages, your orientation, something happened in the past, and this is your excuse not to submit fully to the Lordship of Jesus. And so sometimes you obey Him, sometimes you don't. And so there's no power, there's a need. Because the joy of Christian life is in full obedience. Not 75, not 64, not 95 and 5. You gotta be kidding God. It's everything. You got to give everything to your champion. Let him run your life. So have this conversation with God. Maybe it's your orientation. Maybe it's a psychological break that uh, you, you just, I, I hear this excuse a lot when, when I do counseling, and I'm not saying that it's not valid. It's valid when, uh, when people say, you just don't know what I was up to past. I went through hell and, 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 and whatnot. And I understand, I get that. But what Jesus is trying to tell us, I'm more powerful than your hell. And so I'd like for you to come before Jesus and go ahead and tell him your excuse. And, and he's not going to sidetrack that and tell you, forget about that. He's going to receive that. Lament, go ahead, cry it out to him, you can take it. You're disappointed with Jesus? Go ahead and tell him, you know, I'm disappointed with you, Jesus. Because I've been praying and you're not answering. Go ahead and tell him that. You think he's going to turn away? No, he's not. He's going to receive that and give you his embrace. And hopefully in the days ahead you will have light on why that was the case. What is this? Why did he have to rise? It is this people, listen. Before you have this conversation, Jesus rose from the dead not so that you can have a visa to heaven. A lot of Christians that I know are satisfied with this. I'm born again. I love Jesus. I know I'm going to heaven. But I have lots of things to do yet. And so Jesus understands. Anyway, I'm going to heaven. This is put that way. The index is missing. Because the power of life that Christ gives to his children is indescribable and it's so sweet. It is the sweetest thing. You know how the Father looks at Jesus? with such sweetness. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And everything that my son needs, 
and any, everything and anything that's good for my son, I will never withhold. Listen, do you know that if you put your trust in Jesus, what is true about Jesus in terms of the look of the Father becomes yours. By virtue of your affinity with Jesus, the Father looks at you and He sees His Son. And all the favor that He knows would be good for you will never be without me. And that is the equation for joy. This is not a promise for optimized wealth. This is not a promise for health, optimized living, that there will be no illness, no, not, none of it. But the accompanying, sustaining presence of the center of the universe will never be you. And when the person who manages and runs and owns the universe accompanies you, every waking hour, and even when you're asleep, Tell me what kind of life is that? It's an unbelievable life that's being offered to you. It's not free. It's paid by Jesus who died for you and who rose from the dead. It is now time to have this conversation with God. Just you and your Lord. About a minute. And talk to Him. What's keeping you from fully obeying Him? Tell Him. <coughs> and then I pray that you might find it in your heart to tell Him on this day today. I'm coming home. You have me back again. Lord. Have your way. You are risen. Speak to your Lord for a minute and close in prayer.